I made quite a big deal out of the uh, writers of the New Testament by being eyewitnesses, especially to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. I keep coming back to that because it was one of the overwhelming pieces of evidence that convinced me eventually against my will that it was true. Could he have deceived his disciples? Maybe you remember what was referred to in the U.S. government as the Watergate scandal. That is where some of the, one of the political parties broke into the headquarters of another political party to steal information to use in the campaign. One of the men who directed that, and I always refer to him as the hatchet man at the time he was brought into the administration, is Chuck Colson. Maybe you've read some of his books. He heads up a, a prison work into the prisoners of of jails all over the world to reach them for Christ. But if any man knows how private things become public under pressure, it's Chuck Colson. Let me relate to you what he said about Watergate, relating it to the 12 disciples. He said, here we were, the 12 most powerful men in the United States. This is about in the scandal. All the power of government was at our fingertips. But we could not keep a lie together for three weeks. Now, they weren't tortured. They weren't threatened with death. Are you going to tell me, Chuck says, that those powerless, powerless apostles who were outcasts in their own land could be stoned, persecuted, and beaten? Some, many of them took place over 40 years, never once denying that Jesus was raised from the dead? Impossible, Chuck Colson says. Humanly impossible, unless they had seen the risen Christ face to face. Otherwise, the apostles would have been just another John Dean. John Dean was a, a young lawyer who became a traitor to that group of the powerful 12 and would go to the authorities and give them information to save his own neck. And it said, they would just be another John Dean. He'd have gone in to turn state's evidence. Any one of the apostles would, he said. He had already done it three times, John Dean had. And he's saying, look, here we were, the 12 most powerful men in the world. And we could not keep a lie secret for three weeks. You trying to tell me that over a period of 40 years, the 12 powerless apostles were beaten. They were tortured and threatened with death and eventually killed and never once retracted that on the third day Christ was raised in the dead, men and women. To believe that, you would need to have an intellect of somebody that calls himself a poached egg. When Andre Cole, known as the world's greatest creator of illusion, the man who's referred to as a magician's magician or the illusionist's illusionist, when he set out to refute all the miracles of Christ by explaining it away through modern technology and illusion and magic, most of them, he said, I could not explain away. But there was one. He said, there's no way that Jesus could have deceived his disciples. Do you know what miracle that was? The resurrection. He said, Josh, if the resurrection didn't happen, they absolutely had to know it. This is when he pointed out several things to me. One, he said, no illusionist would hardly ever, ever do an illusion outdoors. Why? Because you have to control the lighting, the visual approach, everything in illusion and magic. Because everything is a, is a simple trick. But he said, almost all of Christ's miracles were done outdoors. Even with our technology today, you'd be crazy to do that. But then he said, second, you have to stand. I have to understand that some of the, uh, the illusionary effects that I create and magical effects that I create for many of the great magicians in the world, it would take anywhere from one to two, even three large, huge semi-load of equipment to do one illusion. I never knew that. Just to do one illusion. He gave me an uh, examples of it. He said, look at Jesus. He had a donkey. And that's when it hit me, whoa, you know, there is no way he could have deceived them. And what Andre concluded was that if Christ was not raised from the dead, 
They had to know it. And therefore, you would have to conclude to the 12 disciples that 11 of the 12 died martyrs' deaths, that they not only died for a lie, but they knew it was a lie. And under the worst torture, and then the threat of death and being killed, never once denied it. I've had over 250 debates in universities around the world. And almost every debate always come back to the resurrection. And I would challenge my opponent to give me one piece of evidence. And I used to joke, it doesn't even have to be credible. Give me one piece of evidence that any disciple under the worst torture ever retracted his belief that on the third day Christ was raised from the dead. And no one in 50 years has done that. If I can't trust them of what Jesus said and did, then I can't trust anyone because they went through the test of death to determine their veracity. Yes, a lot of people have died for a lie, but they always thought it was the truth. If the resurrection of Jesus Christ was a lie, they had to know it was a lie. Therefore, you would have to say that he not, they not only died for a lie and went through that horrible torture and death for what, they, what was a lie, but they knew it was a lie. You've maybe heard of Andre Cole. His real name is Bob Gertler. He's rated one of the world's greatest illusionists. He is a man who can boast. He's the only man alive who has never, ever been fooled by another illusionist. One of his expertise is to create illusion. In his lifetime, he has created and sold almost 2,000 illusionary or magical effects. Uh, many of the great musicians you watch, those uh, magic acts and illusions were created by Andre Cole. He's the one that created the disappearing of the Statue of Liberty. I can't believe it. Three times I've stood just within a few feet of a miniature Statue of Liberty and it would disappear right before my eyes. I remember once I said, Andre, how'd you do that? He said, very well. And I have to admit, he did. But he was a skeptic, a non-believer. And uh, he just thought the Bible was myth and everything else. And a friend of mine challenged him to take his ability as the world's greatest creator of illusion. Um, only man alive who can boast he's never been fooled by another illusionist and apply it, his skills and techniques, to the miracles of Jesus Christ to prove that they were uh, magic acts. After a little persuasion, he accepted that, thinking it'd be very easy. I lived in Canada. I remember when Andre came up there and spent three days with me. What a great three. Most people don't have three minutes, let alone three days with a master. And he shared with me the struggle he went through. He said, I thought it'd be real easy. That all I have to do is approach them with modern day technology and magic and illusion and could explain it all away. He said, several of them I could, but the majority of the miracles of Christ I could not explain away. But he said there was one miracle. One miracle that Christ did that there's absolutely no way through all modern magic illusions or anything to ever explain it away as illusion. In the next segment, I want to tell you what that one miracle was. Can you hold the Bible in your hands and say it is true? I can trust it is reliable. Over a number of segments, I've dealt with a lot of issues uh, concerning the reliability of the Bible. But what I'd like to do now is switch to the third reason or reasoning that convinced me that I could hold the New Testament in my hand and say not only what I have is what was written down, but what was written down was true. Jesus actually did that and said that. Now, this line of reason is based upon this. Listen carefully, because you've probably maybe heard this before, but listen to the way that I present it. Um, here were 12 men. Uh, the apostles, 11 of the 12 died martyrs' death. John died in exile. Judas was replaced. 11 of the 12 died martyrs' deaths. Went through horrible torture, some of the worst torture in history, which I document in my books. And they went through it for one reason. In their own 
words, and this is important, in her own words, in the book of Acts in the New Testament. In chapter 1, in the first three verses, they say this, that after they saw him killed, crucified, and buried, that meant four professional Roman executioners would have signed his death warrant that he was dead, that he was buried. But in their own words, they said, on the third day, he was raised from the dead, and that he lived with them and walked with them, now get this, with many convincing proofs over a period of 40 days. Not 40 hours, not four hours, or four days, for 40 days. They said, after he was killed and buried, he appeared to them with overwhelming evidence. And even going on to say he appeared to over 500 at one time. And Paul said, the majority of them are alive right now. Go check it out for yourself. Now, a lot of people in the university say to me, well, Josh, a lot of people have died for a lie. So what's the big deal? You know they're right. A lot of people have died for a lie. So you say, well, why is this so significant? For this reason. Yes, a lot of people have died for a lie. But they always believed it was the truth. Now, you hear me? Yes, a lot of people have died for lies. But they always believed it was the truth. Now here's the catch. And this is what I struggle with as a non-believer in university. If the resurrection was a lie, they had to know it. Look, in their own words, they said for 40 days. They lived with him with many convincing proofs that he'd been raised from the dead. And if that wasn't true, then they had to know it. If the resurrection wasn't true, they had to know it. And then you'd have to say this. They not only died for a lie, but they knew it was a lie. If that were true, that would be 11 miracles greater than the miracle of the resurrection. Did Jesus really do that? Did he really say that? I've had the privilege of writing and traveling and speaking for 50 years. That's five decades. And over all the years, I've never had anyone ever answer this question. And the question is this, I said, do you believe Jesus said, I am the truth? Well, everybody say, well, of course. I say, how do you know? How do you know? He didn't say, I am a truth, or I am one of many truths. Not one person has ever answered that in 50 years. I have come to the confidence that Jesus said, I am the truth, for many reasons, but one is this. If they didn't dare to add to or take away from what Jesus said and did, because there were people there who were knowledgeable about Christ, they knew what he said, they knew what he did, and they were so hostile they would immediately corrected it. That statement, I am the truth, was so anti-politically correct. Uh, it was an affront to Romanism, it was an affront to Judaism. And if he had not said that, it never could have gotten into Scripture. They'd have said, wait a minute, when did he ever say that? We were there, he never said that. Show me when he ever said that. That was such um, an astounding statement. And besides, ask yourself this. Did the apostles go through all the torture and being martyred and killed because they knew Jesus said, I am one of many truths or I am a truth? No, because I am the truth. You can even go to history, totally apart from the scriptures, and they'll tell you why. Writers will tell you why they died, because Jesus claimed to be the truth. I can trust them that Jesus said, I am the truth, or I am the way, not a way, because they were eyewitnesses. They died for it, and second, it was proclaimed in the presence of knowledgeable people would have known immediately whether he'd ever said that or not, and it never ever could have gotten into Scripture. And if it hadn't, they would have lost all credibility. They wrote as eyewitnesses, and they appealed to the knowledge of eyewitnesses concerning the facts and the evidence about the truth of Jesus. You have probably read Acts 2, verse 22. But I wonder, in as many times as you might have read it, if you saw the switch that took place there. 
Let me show you what I mean. In Acts 2.22, here is Peter speaking to an audience of Jews, and many of them were antagonistic. And notice what Peter said. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus the Nazarene, a man, now get this, a man attested to you by God. Do you see? Up until then it was attested to us, to us, we saw, we heard. Now he's throwing it back on their lap and said, attested to you and to you and to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs, which could be confirmed by the five senses. Now notice what he says. Which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourselves know. Look, if they had not seen those miracles, wonders, and signs, Peter would have been lucky to made it out of there alive. Because there were people in that audience that knew exactly what Jesus said and did. And he constantly appealed to their knowledge of it to confirm the truth of what they were teaching. A good illustration of that is found in the book of Acts, chapter 26, verses 24 to 26. Paul is brought before the king. And Paul is making a defense for the resurrection of Christ and the truth of Christianity. And notice how the conversation goes. And while Paul was saying this in his defense, Festus said in a loud voice, Paul, you're out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. In other words, he was a good politician. But I utter words of sober truth. That phrase, sober truth, in the Greek means of truth and rationale. And so he said, I utter words of truth and rationale. Then notice what Paul does. For the king knows about these matters. See, he's throwing it back in his lap about the truth of what Paul had talked about. The king knows about these matters, and I speak them also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. If I cannot trust the writers of the New Testament of what Jesus said and did, then I can't trust anyone, because everything they believed and said about Christ was confirmed by those who were hostile to Christ himself. One of the best ways to arrive at truth historically about what a person said or did is, was that truth about him presented in the presence of knowledgeable people who would have been exposing it if it was false or anything had been added or taken away? Dr. Robert Grant from the University of Chicago made this observation. At the time they, the Gospels, were believed to have been written, there were eyewitnesses, and their testimony was not completely disregarded. This means that the Gospels must regard as largely reliable witnesses to the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But F.F. F. Bruce, who was probably, and I think I've stated many times, the number one authority in the world on manuscripts until he died just several years ago. And F.F. F. Bruce made this observation about the eyewitnesses, but those who were hostile. Now, it's a pretty long quote. So not, not just read it on the script or hear me say it. Think it through with me. Dr. F.F. F. Bruce wrote, And it was not friendly eyewitnesses that the early preachers had to reckon with. There were others less well disposed who were also conversant with the main facts of the ministry and death of Jesus. The disciples could not afford to risk inaccuracy, nor to speak of willful manipulations of the facts, in other words, what Jesus said or did, which would at once be exposed by those who would be only too glad to do so. On the contrary, one of the strong points in the original apostolic preaching is a confident appeal to the knowledge of the hearers. They not only said, we are witnesses of these things, but also, as you yourselves know, had there been any tendency to depart from the facts in any material respect, the possible pressure of hostile witnesses in the audience would have served as a further corrective. Men and women, you could not ask for a greater context to grasp truth and note of truth is was it presented in the presence of hostile people 
who knew what Jesus said and did, where if they dared to add to or take away, it immediately would have been corrected. Did Jesus actually do that? Did he actually say that? Have you ever wondered that? I sure did as a non-believer. And there were four lines of reasoning that I finally answered the question, I can have confidence in what Jesus said and did. The first was, the writers of the New Testament wrote as eyewitnesses or recorded eyewitness accounts. The second is this, and I'll explain this in several segments. They appealed to the knowledge of their listeners and readers concerning the truth about Christ. You say, no, wait a minute, what do you mean by that? Okay, now follow me carefully. They not only said, look, we were there, we saw Jesus do that. We were there when he did that. We heard him say that. We were there. We saw him do that. But in the presence, now get this, of hostile, knowledgeable Jewish eyewitnesses, people who knew what Jesus did. They knew what he said. Look, Palestine was just a little piece of dirt. Uh, I mean, a small parcel of land. And Jerusalem only had a few thousand people even living in it. They knew what Jesus said and what Jesus did. And they would appeal to their knowledge and they say, you were there. You saw him do that. You heard him say that. You were there when he, he did that. They threw the whole arguments, what Jesus said and did, back on their laps and told him, you know as much as we know of what Jesus said and did. You know, for me historically, that's one of the best tests for truth. Was it presented in the presence of knowledgeable, hostile people where if it was false, it would have been falsified? Dr. John Warren Montgomery, the legal expert, made this statement. This rule underscores the reliability to, to testimony to Christ's resurrection, which was presented contemporaneously in the synagogue. In the very teeth of opposition, among hostile cross-examiners who would certainly have destroyed the case for Christianity had the facts been otherwise. In other words, if they had dared to add to or take away from what Jesus said, there'd have been people there immediately who would have corrected them. Dr. Lawrence J. McKinley of St. Peter's College said the value of hostile witnesses in relationship to the recorded events is first of all, eyewitnesses of the events in question were still alive when the tradition had been completely formed about Christ. And among those eyewitnesses were bitter enemies of this new religious movement when false statements could and would have been changed. There were knowledgeable people there that would have known if anything had been added to or taken away from what Jesus said or did. When it comes to eyewitness accounts and their accuracy, it's important to realize that the church, the original foundation of the church, was completely established by eyewitness accounts of Christ after his resurrection. Read the book of Acts. Verse after verse after verse emphasizes this, that they had personally seen him. And for example, in Acts 2.32, God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. In Acts 3.15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him to life, and we are witnesses of this fact. In Acts 4, for we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. It wasn't uh, hearsay or whatever. It was eyewitness testimony. In Acts 5, the God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead. We are witnesses of these things. And then it goes on to say, we are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. The entire church, the Christianity was founded on eyewitness accounts that on the third day Christ was raised from the dead. I concluded that if I cannot trust them who signed their testimonies in blood, who went through the test of death to determine their veracity, then I can't trust anyone. 
and I'd have to be a total historic agnostic and couldn't believe anything that I ever heard. I believe that what I have in my hands in the New Testament contains exactly what Jesus said and Jesus did because one, it was recorded by eyewitnesses and that is one of the best testimonies we have historically. Now the second uh, test, you might say, that I applied was this. Was the truth presented in the presence of knowledgeable, hostile people where if it was false, if it were false, it would be proven to be? You say, what do you mean? Well, when something is presented, if it is false, are there knowledgeable people there that could falsify it? This completely happened in the New Testament. How do we know that Jesus actually said that or actually did that? One of the first lines of reasoning that I went to was they wrote as eyewitnesses what their ears had heard, what their eyes had seen, what their hands had handled. And Justice Rufin, in the case of State versus Morris, made this observation. All trials, all legal proceedings proceed upon the idea that some confidence is due to human testimony. Some of the best testimony we have histor uh, historically is eyewitness testimony. Now, there are problems with that. I mean, you can perceive it wrong and everything else. And this is why it's good to have multiple eyewitness testimony. In the book of Acts, in chapter 1, verses 1 to 3, the, the apostles, in their own words, was telling what had happened after Jesus was, was crucified, killed, and buried and what happened on the third day? Listen to what they said. To these, these apostles, to us, they said, He also presented Himself alive after His sufferings by many convincing proofs. Now think of this. The disciples are saying that He appeared to us and convinced us with many convincing proofs that He'd been raised from the dead. And then it says this. Appearing to them over a period of 40 days. Not 40 hours, not four days, but for 40 days he appeared to them. In their own words, they said, with many convincing proofs, in the Greek it means overwhelming evidence that he'd been raised in the dead. They wrote as eyewitnesses. All the way through the book of Acts, the entire church was founded on eyewitness testimony. For example, um, in 2 Peter 1.16, Peter said, we did not follow cleverly devised uh, tales. People today say, you know, you can't trust people back there. They couldn't tell the difference between truth and tales or fact or fiction or history or hoax. Look, I'll put Paul and Peter and some of the other apostles up against any professor in any university today. Come on, we're university professors and all would teach that the Da Vinci Code was true. It was factual. Get real. Listen to what Peter said. He said, we did not follow cleverly devised tales. In other words, he was saying, we know the difference between truth and tales. He said, we didn't follow cleverly devised uh, tales. We may know you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus. But what were they? He said, we were eyewitnesses. They wrote as eyewitnesses. And that's some of the most powerful testimony we have for any event or person in history.